Now, I don't know about you, but my goodness, there's enough going on today in there. I mean, go Chiefs. I'm just going to say that right now. Also, we're hoping that a grandpa does or does not see a chat. Also, we're taking a time out from the ordinary green color of Epiphany for a little-known feast of the church that has had great significance in the lives of many over the centuries, the feast of the presentation of Jesus to the temple. Now, in the face of it, you might say, so what? Jesus' parents, they wouldn't have required them. They went and went to the temple, and they uh, did the purification rite, and they presented Jesus, and then someone recognized Jesus, and then they went home. Did what? But what you get is the only other bit of time in Scripture that we have about what Jesus was like as a child. Only in this gospel account do we have the scene of the manger for the angels, the people coming to praise Jesus, who recognize who Jesus is, who've been told about this baby and come and see. Now, so I was talking to somebody uh, was it last week or the week before, I don't remember, about why don't we have more stories about what Jesus was like when he was like a little kid? And then we kind of go from Jesus the baby, and then we fast forward like 30 years, and then Jesus had a minute, right? There are a whole host of apocryphal stories. My favorite is that at about 10 or 11 years old, Jesus is in the market with his mother, and he's being a 10-year-old boy, and uh, there's, a, there's a guy there who dyes cloth, and so he's got bats of yellow and bats of blue and bats of red dye, and so Jesus decides to have some fun, takes a ladle of the red and puts it in the yellow, and takes some of the red and puts it in the blue. And Mary looks and says, Jesus, what are you doing? <laughs> Fix that. He goes, fine, Mom. And he reaches into the red and pulls out just a ladle of yellow. He reaches into the red and pulls out just a ladle of red and puts it back, right? And then he's Jesus, right? <laughs> you want some fun, go Google, like, Jesus is a little kid story. So you get it. Fun. <laughs> but what we have here is something that um, ties it together. Um, a number of things that have been important over the course of time um, for us as people who are disciples of Jesus, um, but also um, keeping with how uh, pure and holy uh, Jesus' parents are. So the purification, I might bear with me for a second. You have that little background. I forget their name, but purification rites were when uh, a baby was born, circumcision happened after seven days. And then after the male child. Then after seven days, uh, after that, and certain size, and then uh, 30 plus three days, um, then the mom was allowed back into society, but not before she went into the purification rite of the temple. You had to go to the temple and, and become pure and clean again, and then you could you know, partake of everything. Um, people died a lot during childbirth. In fact, this is something that this purification thing uh, was, for those of you who remember the 1928 prayer book, you remember um, the service on the liturgy of the churching of women, right? So basically what would happen is you would, the, the, the mom and dad would bring the baby uh, 40 days, it was 30, it was 40 days, right? 40, good number, 40 days after the child was born, the church, and they'd give the, ch- give the child to the priest. The priest told it like a kind of symbol of like, oh, all right, and we named the child and we'd all rejoice, and we welcome that family back into the, back into the parish. Because sometimes moms need a little bit more time to recover from childbirth because, you know, time to die. And you're good. So Jesus' mother is doing this. And you got to think about this, right? The temple's a huge place. It is one of the largest structures in the ancient world. And Jesus and his parents are walking into this thing. And here comes this old guy named Simeon, right? So in your mind, imagine that the kindly old guy greeter at Walmart, that's Simeon. <laughs> Simeon comes up and goes, Finally, my eyes have beheld the Savior. Lord, you can now let your servant depart in peace. I've always wondered if he went home and told his wife, like, I saw Jesus die. <laughs> I don't think so. <clears throat> but here's what's fascinating to me. Two things. Simeon had to be able to look out for Jesus every single day since the 
Holy Spirit said, hey, the Savior, the Messiah's coming. Watch out for him. You'll know when you see him. That strikes me as incredible. Inside the temple, it had to be maybe a hundred kids every day that would come to the temple. And there Simeon was every single day looking for that child, looking for that Messiah, looking for the one that would save Israel, be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the nations. What kind of devotion is that? It's pretty impressive. But he's small potatoes. He gets the most words when he's small potatoes. The lady who's really important is Hannah. Now, Anna, you know, it says that she moved her husband for seven years and then she, you know, died. He died when she was, you know, old, great age. But she's a prophet, like a full-on prophet in ancient Israel. So she would predict the truth and tell what was going to happen, and then, lo and behold, it happened. People believed her. So Simeon's great because he says some things, and, you know, we get that part, and it's the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit. But it's not until Anna recognizes who this child is that the rest of the temple goes, ooh, because they trusted her. She was there every day and night fasting and, and waiting, making prophecies and having them come true. Now, she probably said some wonderful things and thanks to the male slant and everything. We don't have her words, much to our not betterment, worsening, I guess. But I am so sure that that one little sentence about in Jesus' parents were amazed at what people were saying about their child. Wouldn't you be amazed if you walked into church and, like, you know, some old guy came up and said, Oh, finally, I can die because your kid's here. Hooray! And then some other old lady came and said, This is the one! Everybody, come here, take a look and see. But what kind of faith do they have to be looking for constantly to find and see and recognize Jesus the Messiah in their midst? I don't know about you, but as, as, as a Christian, I tend to not, that's tend to be lower on the totem pole of the things I do in my day. You know? Well, my wife's not been funny when the Jehovah's Witnesses or whoever not going to say, you found Jesus? I was like, my God, I didn't know he was missing. Let's go look. Right? Come on, let's go. Right? But our job as Christians is to look for Christ that is present in the world and to be that Anna, to be that Simeon, to say, there it is. There is that moment of holiness. There is that moment of God being present. Hey, everybody, come and look and see. I wonder what your life would look like. I wonder what your day would look like. I wonder what next week would look like if you tried to do that once day. Hey, everybody, this is miraculous. This is God come here. I've just had an experience with the divine. Hey, everybody, come and see. I mean, I double dog here. It means you have to open your eyes in epiphany and have an epiphany. It means you've got to look in with your heart and not see the outer soul, the outer covering of somebody, but see inside them who they are. Because you never know when Jesus is going to show up. Every time the divine's happened in my life, it wasn't until about 20 minutes later where I hit you like a ton of bricks, oh my God, that was God. And almost never, ever does it come as I thought it was going it's always something that's ridiculous and amazing and wonderful. Better than I can ask or imagine. But it's so wonderful and better than I can ask or imagine. I didn't even think it did even dawn on me that's what was happening in the moment. My challenge for us in this epiphany season, not to be like it's Groundhog Day and go look to see the shadow and predict whether it's going to be spring or not. Not to necessarily uh, cheer so much for the Chiefs of the Super Bowl. We can do that too. <laughs> My challenge for us this week in this epiphany season is to have that epiphany. To have that moment where you look beyond what's being presented to you and see what's really being presented to you. Because Jesus may come to you as a little old lady. Jesus may come to you as a dog. Jesus may come to you as your child. Jesus may come to you as someone who's a stranger. Jesus may come to you in a way that you've never noticed. But if we're not looking... We'll never see. And that's what epiphany is all about. Looking for that light in the world, looking for that light inside of us, realizing that we've had a brush with the divine and pointing to it and go, hey, everybody come and see. 